So I've called this a shipbuilder's journey because it's really what it has been for us. Um, it's been a, a journey from being a, a more traditional shipbuilding company into becoming more of a, a technology company. And I think most successful manufacturing companies today are on that journey, but I just want to take you through what that, that, that's meant to us. It all started for us with a, uh, a great piece of corporate theater, I suppose. I rejoined Austell about two years ago, and uh, I came in as technology development manager. I was dead excited about deploying my naval architecture skills, coming up with ever more efficient hull designs, better materials, things like that. But on week two in the job, me and several of the other engineering leads were taken into the boardroom by the CEO and given this inspiring talk about how we all needed to be in technology now. And the centerpiece of this was he gave us all black t-shirts and he told us we needed to wear these and think differently and think about how we were going to transform Austell into a technology company. I thought, this sounds fantastic. This is something I want to be involved with. And then I thought, I'm sitting here as a naval architect. The guy to my right is a mechanical engineer. The guy to my left uh, is a monitoring and control engineer. That's got ones and zeros in it, so maybe that's what we need to do. But really, we all left that room scratching our heads about what all of this would actually mean. So that's what we've been going through the process of uh, finding out over the last couple of years. And we're pretty excited to where we've got to with that. We weren't starting from nothing, though. Austell has been in the technology game in the wider sense of the word for a long time. It's the 30th year of Austell this year. And it's a company which has been founded and built upon innovation. So it built itself up here, in uh, a base just outside uh, Frio in Henderson, on developing and building high-speed ferries. These are highly optimized, lightweight boats, which go very fast. Um, we're talking 75 kilometers an hour. Um, if I go from a traditional ferry, the likes of Sydney Ferry, to the, the sort of ship that we build, that ship carries 1,200 passengers, 240 cars, 450 truck lane meters. So this is a really quite impressive piece of kit. And we wouldn't have been able to, to develop that and become the world's largest aluminum shipbuilder if it hadn't been for our investment in technology in the wider sense. Loads of different strings to that bow. Um, lots of things on this slide which get me excited as a naval architect and probably mean about as much to you as some of the things that I heard about this morning. The, our trimaran hull form is a big one. Um, our ride control system is another one, makes the ride more comfortable for uh, passenger ferry customers. All sorts of different elements to the ship which we've invested in ourselves. Now, one of those, and this sets us apart from a number of other shipyards, is our monitoring and control system. So that's the, the thing labeled, you can just about see it. Uh, it's actually called Marine Link Smart, which is the name of our product. But Marine Link on, on, the, on the bridge there is a uh, SCADA-based monitoring and control system, which brings all the information from all the different uh, equipment around the vessel into one display, which is then presented back to the ops team on the bridge. So we had that as a basis from which to, which to work from. We realized when we started thinking about what our objectives were here, that that was a good starting point, but it wasn't building the data set that we needed to improve the performance of our vessels for our customers. So let's just think about what performance is and what we're trying to achieve. Performance, and here we're specifically talking about high-speed ferries, has two different key aspects to us. One is fuel consumption. If you can minimize the amount of fuel uh, used, these are gas guzzling vessels, then you're going to um, drive down costs, you're going to improve margin for the customers. On the other side of the equation, on the revenue improving side, is improving the motions of the vessel. This is really, really important, particularly on ferry routes where our customers are in competition with airlines and with other ship operators. They need to be able to differentiate. They need to be able to differentiate on the motions. They also need to be able to achieve higher revenue from things like the sale of duty-free and bar sales, which only actually happen if people can get up out of their seats, they feel comfortable, they can walk around. So those are the two objectives, saving our customers money on the fuel and um, providing a more comfortable experience for, the, for their customers. A year ago, we started a project to build a data set which we hypothesized was necessary to provide light. So we take that data, uh, use a, a model up in the cloud, and then push it back down as advice to the crew on board the ship to enable them to operate the ship to meet those two objectives. 
And the system which you see uh, on the ship side of this slide, that's what the crew on the bridge see. So this is one module of it, Trim. It provides advice on how to alter the dynamic, the running trim, so whether the, the ship is bow up or, or bow down. But of course, that's supported by a whole uh, shore side data set and data analysis system which we've developed. So this is where we stray into live demo territory. Um, we've got uh, a uh, Grafana dashboard, which just gives some idea of the kind of data which we're collecting, which has stopped working. But we've got speed over ground, RPM. Um, we've got the GPS data which comes in. We, of course, gather the information on the fuel consumption. We're interested in the environment around the ship, so we collect information on the waves, we pull information from external weather sources. There's about 100 different data points which we need in order to be able to predict fuel consumption and then change the things uh, which, you, which the crew of the vessel can change in order to improve the outcomes uh, and the impact on the bottom line of the operator. The real change that we've had to go through here is to, is to adapt our approach to partnership in order to achieve a successful delivery of this system. So the, the traditional Austal model is we all work really, really hard building a ship down in Henderson. Um, we finish it one day before it's due to be delivered, and then all we'll give it a big thumbs up and wave goodbye as it goes over the horizon. This project is different. Th this project means that we need a much closer working relationship with our customers. We don't operate vessels. We're a ship builder. So if we want to be providing operational advice, we need to be testing our system out with, with trial customers. Um, we worked closely with uh, Fred Olsen in the Canary Islands to develop a, a trial with them where we're pulling all this data back. Um, and we also started close to home with Rotness Express just because they're up the road, they've got a, a reasonably high-speed ferry which we could test a number of different system subcomponents on. Of course, we're working with AWS as a cloud service provider. And then finally, we're working very closely with UWA in particular, but in conversation with all the other universities, both in WA and around Australia more generally, because we recognize that here in Perth, we are in many respects at, at, at the end of the world. And if we're going to hook into new technologies, then going into academia is a very good way of doing that. It gives us a, a, a good route in to finding out about what the latest technologies and all sorts of different IoT areas are which can assist us. I'm going to finish off with three lessons that I've learned through doing this project. They focus really more on the, on the physical side of the IoT, which is a bit different to a lot of the other things that we've talked about, but it's the side of the project which I've been more involved in um, and is more relevant to the uh, Austal ship-specific context. So I hope you take something away from these. The first one, if anyone is trying to put sensors in a maritime environment, the sea is evil and cannot be trusted. We put uh, a number of different distance sensors, as well as uh, some inertial motion units, around Rotnest Express, and something happens to them between here and Rotnest that we've never quite been able to understand. So there was a point during the winter where we just had to stop putting them on. Don't put anything in the forward quarter of a vessel. And we really underestimated that originally. And it's kind of surprising that we underestimated that as a shipbuilder, because we build quite sophisticated ships. But the sensors we, we put on our ships don't uh, traditionally, you know, up on the bridge, they're, they're away from um, the being so close to the waves uh, as the sensors which we've been fitting. So we've learned a lot from that. The second one is the need for us to shore test absolutely everything, every single component of our system before we deploy it to our ships. And I was thinking about this lesson this morning when I was listening to Rob talk about um, the idea of testing software in production. And I was wondering what the analogy is to our hardware for IoT. That the problem that we have found is that every single time we have to pick up the telephone to our customers, to ship operators, and say, oh, this thing isn't quite working properly. Can you give it a little tweak? Can you give it a kick? We're working up um, through a limited, or working down through a limited pot of goodwill that we have with them, because they're busy people, and their priority is running that ship every single day. So we need a really, really solid system, which they don't have to worry about, and we don't have to worry about either. And we've seen that with simple things like wireless, using Wi-Fi networks and wireless access points, and using a slightly different wireless access point in the office to one which was deployed to the ship. Those sorts of things have really bitten us, so we're getting much more rigorous in our testing. 
And finally, and this is my interpretation of a phrase which is, I guess, almost a cliche, but the concept of cattle, not pets, as applied to the physical elements of our system. Um, this is an inertial motions unit. Uh, it's a horrible combination of different things which we threw together to get this cheap little inertial motions unit to work. I thought that was a good idea. I thought it would save us money. It was a total disaster. We have to manually pull all this together. Um, it's susceptible to falling apart. It requires some careful love and attention to keep going. We've moved away from that. We spent another few hundred dollars, and we get this solidly enclosed system which will last probably you know, twice the life of the ship. So that's been really important for us as well. And, and the reason we're, we're thinking about that in particular is because whilst we're still in a proof of value stage here, we were, we're demonstrating the hundreds of thousand dollars a, a, a year of fuel savings that we can provide to our customers. Ultimately, what we're building here is a system uh, to scale. So Austal um, has built over 300 vessels over the 30 years it's been in existence. Plus, there are many more ships out there which our system is applicable to as well. So we want to develop a system which can be scaled, which has the underlying infrastructure, including cloud infrastructure, as well as hardware, which will be suitable to fit to a very large variety of different ships in the future. And ultimately, that will provide us with information to design better ships in the future as well. So I hope you've enjoyed learning a little bit uh, about Austal. I've certainly enjoyed speaking to you. Thank you for your time.